Some of the best conversations I had with my children when they were growing up was on the ride to school, taking them there in the morning. One such occasion was about my baseball glove, a 50-year-old glove that I suggested my son should use at his upcoming baseball game. My daughter objected. Dad, that's no good. You should buy him a new glove. What, do you, you think that my old glove isn't worth using? Of course it's not worth using, my daughter protested. It's old, it's worn out. Get him something new. So you think that baseball gloves are made better today than they were when I was a kid. Dad, everything's made better today than when you were a kid. It was then that I could make a discipleship application to my daughter and to all of my kids. Oh, so you think that Everything that is new is better than everything that was old. But that's not true. There are many things that are better with age, and baseball gloves ha happen to be one of those things. You see, my glove is all broken in. It's not stiff or anything. It's very easy to use. My glove is actually better than a brand new glove. It will serve your brother much better. And there are other things too. Think about a piano. They're still making pianos today exactly the way they've been making the pianos for over a hundred years. It's because the craft was perfected. And you can get a good piano that is, is quite old. They don't necessarily become worse with age. And what about a violin? <laughs> Who in their right mind would not happily trade the most expensive brand new violin for a 300 year old Stradivarius? There are some things that grow better with age. And one of those things right topping the list is the Bible and the gospel that it declares to us. The Bible never goes out of date. The, the, the Bible never gets old. And anyone who tries to improve upon it only ruins it. We've got to keep the Bible, keep the gospel exactly as it was revealed 2,000 or in parts of the Bible up to to three, three and a half thousand years ago. Well, let me make application today of this principle that sometimes the old ways are the best ways. I want to make application of that principle to parenting. Last week, we looked at the don'ts of parenting from the example of Isaac and Rebecca. But in fairness to Isaac and Rebecca, none of us is a perfect parent or grandparent. And Isaac and Rebecca had some good points, and that's what we're looking at today, the do's of good parenting. We'll see that Isaac and Rebecca do pray when they are perplexed. And all of us have those times when we are perplexed, we're confused, we're having a hard time. That's the time to pray, and that's what they did. We are, we'll also see that they do trust when they are tested. And all of us are tested from time to time, and our children and our grandchildren see that. Will they see that we are trusting God through the test? And then thirdly, and we'll spend most of our time on this point, do dig when you are displaced. Do dig when you are displaced. And that's talking about digging the old wells. Let's remember our heritage and let's go back to our heritage and let, let's not throw out things just for something that's fanciful and new today because there are many things, the Bible topping the list, God topping the list, that can never be improved upon. 
nor should we ever try. Well, let's get started with these do's. Do pray when you are perplexed. Genesis 25, verse 21. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. Isaac is perplexed. He is 60 years old. He has been married to Rebekah for 20 years, and they have exactly zero children. The promise God made depends upon them having children. So why aren't they having children? What is going wrong here? Well, Isaac has some choices. Isaac could take things into his own hands and get a concubine or two like his father had done. Isaac could blame it all on Rebecca and have a bad attitude towards her, maybe divorce her, get a new wife. Isaac could give up on God. He could have a bad attitude towards God. But that's not what Isaac does. He does the right thing. He's perplexed, and so he prays. He prays. The word is entreat. He entreated the Lord. That means he prayed earnestly. He begged God. God was his one, his only, his best option. And with that kind of confidence, he implored the Lord. He implored the Lord to give them a child. Well, Rebecca conceives. God answers. Now it is Rebecca's turn to be perplexed because this, this pregnancy is not going well. She has turmoil in her womb, and she's wondering what in the world is going on. We read about it in verse 22. And the children struggled together within her, and she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. If it be so, why am I thus? That's the same as saying, what in the world is going on? This is meant to be a blessing? This is torture. Well, what is happening in my womb? Now, she has some choices. She, she could go to Planned Parenthood and plan an abortion. This one's not going so well. Let's get rid of these and try to get another. She could have done any number of things. But Rebecca does the right thing. She inquires of the Lord. She inquires of the Lord, and the Lord answers. The Lord helps her to understand what is going on in her womb and how that will be played out in the lives of these twins. Prayer. Prayer is an old solution, but it cannot be improved upon. It is the best solution. It is a wonderful thing. The power of prayer, the mercy of our God who hears us and who answers us according to his will. Prayer works. It may be old, but it is the best. I can't help but think, what would happen if Isaac and Rebecca lived in our day and age? Childlessness? Isaac, you better go to IVF. You and Rebecca. Turmoil in the womb? Rebecca, there's Planned Parenthood, or um, maybe you should get some counseling. Prayer must be our first recourse. Is it for you? Do you pray when you are perplexed? Are you perplexed right now? Let your children and your grandchildren see. See that you pray with confidence in the Lord. Number two, do trust when you are tested. Do trust when you are tested. Now, several years later, a famine strikes. That is a test. We read about it in chapter 26. And there was a famine in the land, that's a test, beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt, dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. So a famine strikes. Isaac has no food for his wife his two boys, what is he going to do? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is Egypt. Let's go to Egypt. They have plenty of food. Besides, his father had taken that path once before. But God tells Isaac, do not go to Egypt. Isaac now has a, a choice. Will he obey God 
Or will he go with conventional wisdom? Will he join the throng of refugees that are headed to Egypt? Isaac obeys God. Verse 6, And Isaac dwelt in Gerar. Now, never mind that while he was dwelling there, he told that big lie, This isn't my wife, this is my sister. And his father had done that too. I'm not commending that. We covered it last week with the don'ts. But let's focus on the positive. Isaac obeyed God. He trusted God enough that he obeyed and he did not go to Egypt. We commend him for that. Famines are an experience that all of us have. There are many different kinds of famines. Perhaps you are in a famine today. A famine can be a famine of food, such as Isaac was facing, and that's something that's occurring in Papua New Guinea at this very moment in time. You might want to pray for our brothers and sisters in Papua New Guinea for some rain. But there are other ways that famines can happen. Are you experiencing a run of bad health? That is a physical famine. Perhaps you have a chronic condition, a physical or a health famine. It's painful. Yet you feel desperate. Yet you cannot see a way out. That's what famines are like. Or maybe you're facing a financial famine. You're struggling with finances. Interest rates are so low, you hardly make anything off of savings. Maybe your income isn't enough to stretch from month to month, and you are struggling with that. It's a financial famine that is painful, and you're desperate, and you feel like there's no way out. Or maybe it's a, a social famine. Do you feel lonely? Do you feel isolated? A lot of people are feeling that way during this pandemic. Social distancing is social isolation for, for many of us, and, and we, 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 we don't have that closeness of relationships that every person craves and needs. These are difficult times during COVID. Are you feeling that? Are you feeling that pain of loneliness, of isolation? Are you feeling desperate? Are, are you, as you look, is there any way out? When, when is this thing going to end? Uh, we're all thinking that, aren't we? As it just keeps going and going and going. Or it could be for other reasons uh, that you might feel lonely or isolated. That is a social famine. This is what famines are. Famines are a test. A test to prove what our true colors are. Will we, even in the famine, trust God. Isaac and Rebecca did. They trusted and they stayed. They didn't go to Egypt. Will you trust? Will you trust God in the test? As our children and our grandchildren age, they will tell stories to their children and their grandchildren about 2020, the pandemic, the year that we lost, their memory of the events of, of this year, that the influence in their life from this year will be profound. Now you ask them about 2019, pretty ordinary year. They won't remember much about that, but they'll remember 2020. May it be that what is transformative to their life is the example they see in their parents and their grandparents who who trusted through the test. We come now to number three. Do dig when you are displaced. Do dig when you are displaced. We all have occasions in life when we are displaced. Things are unsettled. It might be a physical move. It might be a job move. It might be uh, a change in relationships, a change in church even. We, we have those seasons when we are displaced. What should we do when we are displaced and things are unsettled? Now I'm going to read for you from Genesis 26 some verses that are easy to gloss over, but these verses have three very important principles, and it's all about digging. 
digging wells. Dig old wells, dig new wells. Pay attention to the wells as I read from verse 16. And Abimelech said unto Isaac, Go from us, for thou art much mightier than we. And Isaac departed thence and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. So you understand what's happening. Isaac is seeing out the famine there in, in Gerar, the land of the Philistines. And Abimelech, the king there, sees that, hey, they're getting a bit too strong for us. They're too prosperous for us, and so we're going to kick them out. Verse 18. And Isaac digged again the wells of water, which they had digged in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham, and he called their names after the names which his father had called them. And Isaac's servants digged in the valley and found there a well of springing water. So there's success. Success. They've been forced to move on. They need water. They redig the old wells. Verse 20. And the herdmen of Gerar did strive with Isaac's herdmen, saying, The water is ours. And, we, and he called the name of the well Esek, because they strove with him. That's what Esek means, to strive or to argue. And they digged another well and strove for that also. And he called the name of it Sitna which is enmity, being enemies over this water. So they repossessed that one too. And he removed from thence and digged another well, and for that they strove not, and he called the name of it Rehoboth. And he said, For now the Lord hath made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. And he went up from thence to Beersheba. And the Lord appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bless thee, and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And he builded an altar there, and called upon the name of the Lord, and pitched his tent there, and there Isaac's servants digged a well, a new well. And so we have old wells, verse 18, and we have new wells, verse 19, and also verse 25. Both are important for providing a family life-sustaining water. And I'm saying that metaphorically. The old wells, the traditions, principally the Bible, the new wells, our expression of faith. Both are essential. Now I want to make three observations or point out these three principles. Number one, there is wisdom in revisiting and redigging the old wells. That is wise. Look again, verse 18. And Isaac digged again the wells of water, which they had digged in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham, and he called their names after the names by which his father had called them. Tradition, heritage, how important is it? It is absolutely essential. And our children, our grandchildren must see it. Let's redig. Let's be wise to redig the old wells. Now that goes counter to our marketing society. New and improved. That is what's constantly announced to us as a marketing tool. You, you take some laundry soap that's been around for a hundred years, slap a bright yellow sticker on it that says new and improved, and the sales go up. Because the God of this age has duped us into believing that new equals best. New equals best, but that's a fallacy. There are some things that cannot be improved upon. Those are the old wells, and we must redig the old wells, and we must bring our children and our grandchildren to the old wells so that they can enjoy that which is precious, that which has stood the test of time, that, in the case of God's Word, which is true and our hope and our joy and the love of God and our eternity. How essential it is to dig the old wells. But sadly, there are many churches today who have swallowed the lie of the devil and they are promoting, they are acting on this false faith that the way to build a church today, that the way to, to, to enjoy life, the way to be the best person you can be has to be all new. It's got to be new music. 
It's got to be a new building. It has to be new and exciting experiences. And so it's no surprise to us that the, the, the churches, the religious leaders who get the most publicity, they, they actually engineer that publicity, the ones that do that are ones who have rejected the Word of God, who have rejected the tradition of, of Christ's church, who have rejected the hymns and all these sorts of things in favor of flashy marketing. Just because you slap a new and improved sticker on it doesn't mean that what's inside is all that satisfying or good for you. Our God warned us that in the last days there would be all kinds of people with newfangled messages saying they came from God. And the Bible warns us against that. Let's stick to the old wells. I want you to hear this warning from 2 Timothy 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Too boring. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. The great tragedy of our days is our day is that it wasn't the Philistines. We didn't need the Philistines to fill in the old wells. Christians have filled them in themselves. It's time to redig. Old hymns, not fun enough to dance to. Expository preaching, not experiential enough. Disciple making, not instant enough. It's time to redig the old wells. The old wells were and they are the truth. They are not superficial fluff that is 100% marketing and 0% substance. Let's get back to the old wells. What are the old wells? The Bible. Believe the gospel. Stand for the gospel. That Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. That Jesus was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture. That is the historic gospel. There is no improving upon it. And if you are a sinner and have not yet come to Christ for salvation, don't be looking to the latest self-help book. That is an insult to God. Self-help is an, it is an oxymoron. You cannot help yourself, especially out of your chief problem, which is your sinfulness. You need a Savior. The Savior is Jesus Christ, once for all delivered for us. Another old well, defend the doctrine. Defend the doctrine. Now, there's a trend among some church people that, oh, doctrine doesn't really matter. All that matters is that you love Jesus. Uh, that's a load of rubbish. This is what the Bible says in Jude. Contend for the faith. Contend for the faith. The faith is the body of doctrine. Does it matter what we believe about the nature of God, that he is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Absolutely it does. Does it matter what we believe about Jesus, that he's 100% man and 100% God? Absolutely it does. Does it matter what we believe about the Holy Spirit, that he is active in the world today, that he indwells believers, that he is the one that draws people to salvation, that he is the agent of regeneration? Of course it's important what we believe about that. Is it important what we believe about the church, what the Bible teaches about the church, what the Bible teaches about sinfulness, what the Bible teaches about us as people, what the Bible teaches about the future? Are these things important? Of course they are. And so let's defend the doctrine. Another old well, practice the disciplines. Read your Bible. Don't let it gather dust on a shelf. Read your Bible. Pray to God. Go to church. Share the gospel. Let's redig the old wells. The old wells of our worship. Should we throw out the hymns like so many churches have done? I've heard from various people say, I've moved to a new area and I cannot find a church to attend. I cannot find a church because all they've got is this, this new music. And I can't understand what they're saying, or it's boring, or it's repetitive. What happened to the hymns, the classic hymns? 
we ought not to abandon our heritage. And our heritage is wrapped up in the hymnody of the past. Our hymnal has some hymns that are centuries old. They've stood the test of time. Why? Because they have substance in their lyrics and they have singability in their music. We ought not to be throwing out the hymns. We need to sing. We need to, we, we need to keep our heritage alive. Now there's a balance to that. That's not to say only old. Remember, Isaac also dug some new wells. And there are new hymns. But the test for the new hymns is that substance. Is it faithful to God's word? It, are, are these lyrics worth remembering? Is this music worth passing on to the next generation? Not everything that is produced remains. It's only that which is quality that will stay. And let's redig that old well. Second principle. There is wrestling over old wells. Don't be surprised when you face opposition. When you start to open the old wells, they're going to come after you. Verse 20. And the herdmen of Gerard did strive with Isaac's herdmen, saying, The water is ours. And he called the name of the well Esek, which means strive. And then he dug another well, redug another well. They strove over that. And he called the name of it Sitna, that is enmity. Isaac, he's redigging the old wells. And along came the Philistines, who were militarily more uh, equipped, they're stronger than him, and they take over those old wells as soon as he can undig them. And that's what's going to happen when we are faithful to the old wells. You can expect to be criticized. You can expect to be mocked. There will be striving. There will be quarreling. If there's something that succeeds, they're going to take it over. They're going to, going to attempt to take it over from you. If, if while, the, while you're digging, they're going to say you're stupid. And when you succeed, they're going to take it. You can expect enmity. You can expect quarreling. And you can expect it to escalate. Now, when that happened to Isaac, he made a lateral move. He did not engage in fighting, nor did he quit digging. Very important there. He didn't give up. He kept moving until he finally got far enough away that they didn't bother him anymore. And that's instructive for you and me. Sometimes fighting for our rights causes us to lose our moral high ground. And that's too big of a cost. It's better to make a lateral move, to be defrauded of that well, rather than to discredit our message. But we must never quit digging. What happens if secularists wrestle away from us special religious education in the public schools? What happens if the tax department wrestles away from us the exemption for property tax for churches? What happens if Facebook and YouTube wrestles away from us the right to free speech and won't let us put our services online? Well, if that happens, and I have no doubt that at some point in time those things will happen, we must never stop digging wells. We must keep digging. We must keep preaching Christ no matter what. We must stand for biblical morals no matter what. And we must raise our children and our grandchildren to love the Lord no matter what. We keep digging. But on this matter, also beware the enemy within. For one reason why the old wells don't get redug is because we become apathetic, we become complacent, we compromise here a little bit or there a little bit, and it's the internal enemy that disrupts our well digging. Don't let it happen. Let's, let's not give up with the wrestling. Let's expect it. There will be a battle over the old wells. And then third principle. There is wonder beside the old wells. This is glorious. There is wonder beside the old wells. For once, Isaac finally got that well that could be his own. What did he do? Well, maybe I should say what happened to him. 
what happened is God appeared to him that same night and God repeated the promise he had made to Abraham and God uses his precious name he says I am oh what what bedrock in that I am the God of Abraham thy father fear not for I am with thee don't be concerned about the perplexity don't be concerned about the testing don't be concerned about the, the rivalry, about the battle, about the conflict, about the arguing, about the, the enmity as you stick to those old wells. Don't be concerned about fear not, God says. I am with thee, and I will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And what did Isaac do? He builded an altar there. He called upon the name of the Lord and he pitched his tent there. That's where he would live. God is not found in the flash of the newfangled. God is found in the place where he has always been. And when you come to this unchanging, ever merciful God, you will be in awe and wonder. And it will inspire you to worship and to work for the Savior. This is where you and I must bring our children and our grandchildren. We must bring them to the well. Bring them to the well so that they can see our God, so that they can trust our God, so that they can have opportunity to believe and to follow our God and then be filled with the wonder and the awe of his presence. Will you do that? Will you trust and obey? Will you be true to the Lord and dig those wells? Father, we depend upon you. These are difficult times, but you are great and you are undeterred. And so we look to you we pray, we trust, and we dig with confidence that you give to us life that is abundant and free and eternal. Oh, we praise you in the name of Christ. Amen. I trust you'll be encouraged this week. I pray that God will be near to you and you will be near to him. There's no better place to be. God bless you.